Is it all the block? Upfield it goes, caught by Nico Collins. He's all the way to the five. Collins, a rookie out of Michigan. They traded up to get this 6 4 wide receiver. Phillips looking to find a crack as he bulldozes his way in for the touchdown. Empty backfield, love first and ten. Crumbling pocket knocked away from behind. It's loose. It looked like Grenard was the one to get it and falling on the ball was Johnson. The run here again, Phillips. Oh, he stiff arms his way into the secondary. But then it was too much time and too much Roy Lopez. Bounces outside. The quarterback will lead him inside the 10 with an empty move to the pylon and touchdown. And welcome to another episode of the Turn Up For What podcast talking your Houston Texans straight from the Great British Isles. We finally played a game, we've won a game, albeit pre-season, but 2067 was a result in Green Bay. And uh, we've actually got a trip to talk about to Dallas as well this week. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching any of the mediums, hit the like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment, get those algorithms churning as we're finally branching out into a bit of visual uh, this off-season. But delighted to be joining me, a good friend of mine, uh, James, a young Ari Gold from Texas Unfiltered. How you doing, man? I'm good, brother. That's, how long has it been since we've since we've last recorded? I think it was right before I went on my little sabbatical, right? Yeah, I think so. We we, we taught Jacksonville game on the road, and then we taught not long after the Casario hire trans, uh, trade request. I say transfer request is a bit of a soccer term, but yeah, trade request <laughs> uh, for Watson. Yeah, so it's been a it's been a, a an old off season. I suppose we probably don't want to harp on too much about the the latest, but I suppose there is some material updates in terms of, well, I mean, nothing breaking news about the uh, NFL bungling their investigation or being a bit heavy handed or coming across a bit tone deaf because, you know, that's, that's who they are, I suppose. But I suppose the grand jury investigation kind of does, you know, I'm not a law expert and certainly not Harris County law, but, you know, I, I suppose that brings a real possibility considering it's the human trafficking unit that's doing it. I suppose that does bring about a possibility. What size of that, we don't know. But, you know, it could take them out of football, potentially, if it was to go against them. Yeah, you know, I think um, you know, very early, I think both of us, are, you know, like you said, we're not we're not lawyers. We, we You know, we, we, we have a somewhat of an understanding of how, you know, laws work and, and court cases and things of that nature. But it's no different than the person that's probably listening to the podcast right now. Um, but with everything that's going on, subpoenas being issued and things of that nature, it's definitely um, <clears throat> it's definitely interesting and a lot different than what we anticipated them to be because there was all these talks of civil cases and, and and things of that nature, and then out of nowhere, here comes you know potential human trafficking charges, prostitution charges, things of that nature, and um, now we're talking about you know will he play football again? You know, is it going to be a year suspension? Is he going to settle out of court? And then, you know, the criminal charges go away. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, <clears throat> but something tells me the Texans kind of knew these things ahead of time. Yeah. I, 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 I do think that the Texans kind of had an idea. Um, I, I think the, uh, the Texans kind of have an idea on what's going, what was coming down the pipe and how to manage it. And I think a lot of the reason why we saw the way that they were managing it um, was – you know, hiding him, you know, to an extent, yeah. you know, changing practice times and then having, you know, morning practices and then having press conferences before and then here comes Deshaun and things of that nature. So, um, you know, I applaud the Texans for the way they've handled it. And I know there's a lot of cynics out there and, and the Texans are definitely the laughing stock to a certain extent for some of the things that have happened. But I really do think that they've actually handled the situation pretty fairly um, and, and in, in the right way. Yeah, I, I think I think so. There, there's an element of there's an element of just the unknown, and there's an element of it's been a bit of a circus. But I think yeah, it, it continues to overshadow this team. And I know you guys were talking about that, you know, and a, a lot of people have kind of pushed back. You've even heard the, the media, sports radio hosts talk about you know push, people pushing back on are sick about hearing about what's and I suppose he is still the best player on this team, and until that changes, I suppose he is the big story. But I think everybody just wants a bit of closure, and everybody's got fatigue on the whole thing because. All you've heard is, you know, various, you know, positions of leverage, of timing, of, you know, legality. And I think people are kind of over it. They, this team's been a soap opera for all of off season. It continues to be. And I suppose with Watson, a trip to stick his chicken just off, uh, just off Washington Avenue uh, gives a bit. Of, well, I don't know if it was there. Uh, 
but uh, but certainly it gives uh, gives three of your tackles COVID, uh, or when one of them and two of them are close contact. I suppose that's probably a reminder to everybody and 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 the players themselves. So you have got to be careful what you're doing because you know you're probably likely all to all three likely to miss games. Probably only Rod Johnson is the one that you know sets her is stood to miss out the most. But you've also got to think the whole kind of rotation of all the different positions in the offensive line that you know that was a good chance for Titus Howard and Marcus Cannon. You know, who knows if he'll play this year, um, that he could have submitted himself at right tackle as well. So it, it, it's a bit of, it doesn't bring stability at a position room that needs it the most. And it's also something that probably uncertainty um, that people were maybe looking to find out. And I suppose they probably won't do that this or did on Saturday or, or do this week either. Yeah, you know, I think with the COVID stuff uh, and everything that's going on at the tackle position, I do think there's still enough time for them to be able to work through it and, and, and get things going in the level that is needed. Um, yeah, Marcus Cannon, you know, Rod Johnson definitely hurt himself the, the most just because he was a fringe player anyways. Um, not that he's not a decent tackle because we've seen at times he he's might be the best backup tackle we've had over the last two to three years. Um but I, I do still think there's enough time for them to figure all that out. I mean, it's it's just an interesting year given that, you know, I think the plan for the NFL and just from a fan perspective too was, you know, we're, we're, we're once the off season started and we really started to get going, we really thought that there was a chance that the, the year was going to be normal. We thought vaccinations are here, you know, people are going to get better. COVID's going to start to go away. And then out of nowhere, here it is again, and people are still getting you know, we're still having positive tests throughout the NFL. So it's going to be something that they're all going to have to manage and go through. But definitely the offensive line is <clears throat> something that we need to be a little bit concerned about because they did make investments in it and they brought in players and they have guys that should be able to take that next step. But, you know, that camaraderie that is built through the offensive line, which is something that we, me and you seem to always talk about whenever we do connect is how important that chemistry is between all the players on the offensive line and, uh, you know, guys missing here and there. It's really hard to build that. Yeah, I think it's going to be even more important this year because you've not got somebody to bail you out necessarily with, you know, dynamic athleticism at the position. Albeit, you know, Tyrod, you know, has shown he's still not lost, you know, much much of his much of his get up and go. But before we come into some of the players and what you took away from the the game on on Saturday night, James Casario in the booth with a headset. I know people asked him that at his open press conference. He dismissed it. Um, we've just gone from having a head coach who thinks he's a GM. Do we have a GM who thinks he's a head coach as well? No, I think I think what we have is a second set of eyes. To be honest with you, yeah, you know, I I, I think that's all it is. I, I, anybody, <clears throat> like I said at the beginning, if you could find any way to poke a hole or poke the Texans, you're going to whether you're the media or national media or fans. Um, this is something I think is being blown completely out of proportion. He's yeah. he's he did this in New England for twelve years, like, and we all know he didn't run the ship right we all know he wasn't the coach and i don't think it's any different here i think it's just an extra set of eyes that can bring up certain things to to coley and the other coaches and that's really about it yeah i saw we were uh watch i was watching the game back i never actually watched it live on saturday just saturday night so i think you've you know after covid you got to, you got to use them all that you can these days but um i, I thought it was just speaking to a couple of guys and one of the first thing he said was do you ever thought maybe he just didn't want to sit home to listen to cal for two and a half hours in the owner's box and they said well fair enough actually that's probably a good enough reason if any to, <laughs> to get up into the uh thing managing him and hannah might not be uh, his idea of uh, football and he's not the most sort of uh political game player is he so i think he's uh he's probably there i, I think it's good as well because you've got a first-time head coach who was yeah. who was there and he probably needs the support you know i know he talked about being old school and not willing to go for it on fourth down if he wasn't feeling it um, as he put um, when he talked to the media yesterday, uh, prior to practice, but, what did what did you but that's think? That's also no different. <clears throat> that's no different than what Harbaugh does. No, no, Harbaugh leans on analytics and then goes when it comes to 50-50 decisions, he leans with his gut. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, I think that that quote was maybe taken a little bit out of context. Yeah. I do think that you know they made a pretty heavy investment over the last two years in analytics, bringing in a lot of analytics guys. Um, so I'm, analytics are a part of the game for them. I, I just think that with all head coaches, most likely, they're not going to look at, at a probability sheet in a game time situation, you know, down four 
and decide to you know well the analytics say i should i should punt or the anal they're gonna say go for it or whatever they feel yeah. is the right decision to make um just like anybody else does in any other position that they hold so i mean you know coley <clears throat> look i'll tell you this it's a big shift from what we had to what we're at do i think coley is coach of the year uh, no probably not yeah. um but but do i think that he's got his guys wanting to play for him and that we saw a lot of effort in our first preseason game preseason you know albeit it's preseason but that team went out and there was a ton of effort throughout the entire game at all levels whether it was starters you know second team third team everybody was out there trying to make a play and i think that's really what we what we want right now, right? We, we need to see some of these vets. We need to hit on a couple of these one-year vets, right? Yeah. So we can have some, some pieces to build on. Um, and, you know, I think, I think the players like playing for them. And ultimately, that's really what you're looking for is you want to make sure that you have a coach that can relate to the players, can get the most out of them, and put them in a position to succeed. And when you look at the coaching staff all around, you know, everybody's talking about James Campton right now um, and the offensive line, and he was mic'd up, you know that's such a breath of fresh air when you come from Mike Devlin, like when you see a guy actually coaching and then you see it with Pep and you, you just see it across the board. And that's ultimately what we wanted from OB was kind of let the reins, let the reins go and let your, let your, co your coaches coach. And you just manage the situation. I think that's exactly what Coley's doing. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It seemed to be, yeah. I think there will be times that we'll have to, you know, he'll have to be aggressive. Maybe he'll be encouraged to be aggressive beyond what would maybe be natural to him because the amount of drives we have, we're going to have to, you know, be efficient um, and squeeze as many points as we can out of the, the offensive unit we've got. Um, I don't think it's a big deal, uh, but I think in a soft environment like that, when you were only going to give Tyrod Taylor one drive, I don't see any harm in going for it. If it was any, any less than five yards, I think on a fourth down, it's makeable. Um, I'm sure the percentage of the analytics will stack that one up, but there was de definitely a feeling of maybe the left points on the on the on the field and the maybe left reps out there that Tyrod could have had. Um, I'm assuming you know we'll come on to the game upcoming and we'll probably see more of them. But is this an interesting dynamic in terms of the coaching staff? You you, you touched on what did you make of? I suppose the defense is the biggest change. Uh, without you know too too specific and the players will go on to that. But what did you think of Lovey Smith's four three and how the guys set up? Um, you know, for, for a first game, I thought they actually played much better than I anticipated. Um, you know, it looked like everybody was there. They were swarming the ball. <clears throat> Lonnie looked good uh, playing with the ball in front of him, uh, which was, a, you know, a beautiful thing to see. Um, secondary was, was okay. Um, I, I think it's really hard to judge this defense. One of the things that I don't like to do is judge defense based on preseason. Yeah. Um, because I, I think that's really the one side of the ball that you really can't get much out of. Uh, especially like in, in this specific game, right? No Aaron Rodgers, no Devontae Adams, you know, <clears throat> no A.J. Dillon, no Aaron Jones. Like this is no, no David Bakatar, or I always forget how to say his name, but <clears throat> they're, they're a starting tackle. So it's really hard to judge what this defense will look like, but I think for a preseason game, they, they did what you would want them to do. They forced turnovers. Um, they looked aggressive which I think is really probably the biggest culture change from what we're used to. Right. Um, that's not what we've seen from rack in the no. past. That's not <laughs> what we saw from, from um, God, Anthony Weaver. Like the, those are the types of things that I like that I saw. I just want to see it happen in a real game for me to be able to say like this defense looks like it could potentially be a promising defense. Now, you know, we were the 32nd ranked defense last year. You know, if you're 24, 22, that's an improvement. Um, and if you can force some turnovers, which is where the Texans have finished dead last in, you know, God, God knows how many years, like that, those are game changing. That's a game changing stat for, for the team. So, yeah. Yeah. I suppose a team that I think what was it seven or eight last year, uh, well, single digits anyway, forcing three in one game was right. good to see Jill Johnson jumping on a couple. Um, and Jonathan Grenard getting on on one as well, but I think it was. I suppose there was there was a, a gut. Well, it's probably it's probably the, the weakness of a of a cover two zone predominantly scheme where you saw the tight end got them right up the middle, and I suppose that's on tape now. Not that's new news to anybody in the league, and it's probably one of the biggest criticisms of the scheme. All schemes have pluses and minuses, right? But there was yep. definitely 
it definitely shows you that we're going to have to be reliant on the linebackers. And look, Neville Cute was in there at Mike. Um, I don't think he's, he's he's much. I think he's good with the game in front of him. It looked like not behind him, but it showed you that you know there is there is a, a weakness to that. And hopefully, we'll you know we'll have personnel that can match up better um, in those passing situations. But you, you just saw probably one of the things why people have kind of maybe called the scheme a bit outdated, a bit kind of um, old school, if you like. And Lovey Smith is. Uh, Rockins, one hell of a beard. I think he's, he must that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, must be professionally maintained that. But uh, he looks he beautiful looks like, beard. <laughs> but he looks he looks he looks confident <laughs> in the sideline doing what he's doing. And I think he's probably relishing being back in the league. Um, it seemed pretty rigid base base formation pretty much whole time. As you said, you can't take a lot out of the uh, scheme, and you're more looking at personnel and individuals. But but yeah, it's probably just a reminder to everybody that there is a big there is a big hole. You know, that's going to sit in between your your deep two safeties and your three linebackers, and they don't get enough depth, and people are going to pick up you know easy easy completions in the zone. Um, but in terms of surprises, James, was there any guys that stood out to you that you didn't expect that um, you know earlier or later in the game um, that were out there making plays that you that was a pleasant surprise? You know, I I would be the the guy that I don't want to say surprise, but the guy that it was nice to see perform at somewhat of a high level is Davis Mills. And I know a lot of people are going to say, you know, he wasn't really good. He was average. But when you look at where he was drafted, you look at his experience in college and you look, you compare his first two series to the rest of the game. You saw improvements. You saw development. You saw exact, you saw a comfortable and confident quarterback that was willing to stand in the pocket, make the throws. I mean, I think he had three third down conversions. I think the smallest one was eight yards. The highest one was 13. Like those are the types of throws that you want your quarterback to be able to make in those types of situations. Um, He looked like he was able to put enough zip on the ball and out throws, uh, which is, you know, those are some of the hardest throws to make in the NFL. Um, And I think, I don't know if he's got the potential to be a starter, but when you compare all the reports that we were hearing and seeing in training camp, and then you put on the tape and you're able to see what he did in this first preseason game. um, I definitely think that that was probably one of the biggest things to take away from the game is that Davis Mills has a ceiling. We just don't know what the ceiling is yet, Um, but he played well. It's an odd evaluation, I think, because you've got some of the hardest stuff like footwork, just gen- general kind of demeanor and command. You saw him up at the line, albeit before, I think it was before the, the interception, uh, or no, it was before the screen the screen pass that he, he threw yeah. in the dirt. And it, look, that's a carryover from college, but by no means is not fixable. So you think, you know, there's, there's positives there um, in that, you know, there was the, the wheel route to, to uh, Scotty Phillips and it should have just get a bit lower um, than it was in. The ball has a tendency to come out at some interesting angles. Um, not seen the all twenty two yet, but from the few angles you did you did, you did see, there was a couple of interesting release points. Um, so he needs to maybe clean those mechanics up a bit. But in terms of his lower half, in terms of his footwork, in terms of uh, in some of the some of the fundamentals he showed, I think there's a lot to work with. I think that the issue what people will need to understand is he needs to clean up the basics because those you know missed screen passes, you know stuff, easy money stuff. They all added up in that game. And if you even add one or two of those in, you might sustain some drives, maybe put some more points on, on the board. He's deep ball, you know, both two times he went for, I think it was either Chris Moore or Erickson um, in the back of the end zone, going to the left of your screen. And, and then on the first drive, uh, when they got the short field, he, he rolled out and just just put it ahead of Anthony Miller. It should have been a PI. Um, I screenshotted that out today and it almost looks like a Madden glitch where he's got two guys <laughs> jumping over him, not, neither turning around to... You know, go and try and make a move on the football. So, you know, the definition of a PI or what we've been fed uh, in recent years. But there was a lot of good stuff to work with there. And I, I think it was it was a pleasant surprise. And I think the fact that he, considering he did, he actually did a lot of the hard stuff better than he did the easy stuff. So you, there's, there is moldable clay to work with there. Where that ends up, who knows? That's up to him. But it was certainly, it was a pleasant surprise, I think, um, more than anything. That throw on the run. That throw that rollout and throw on the run, like while yes, the placement could have definitely been better given the size of the wide receiver. Yeah. But if you had, you know, a veteran wide receiver like even small ass Brandon Cooks or Nico Collins or Chris Conley on that route, I think the situation would have been a little bit different. Um, but when you look at where that ball is in the in the end zone, 
Like it's only where Anthony Miller could have potentially yeah. made a play. Yeah. Like, and that's, that's, those are the things that you want to see from your quarterback, right? You want to see that the placement, maybe it's off a little bit. You prefer to see better placement, but it was only in an area where Anthony Miller can make the catch. And I think those are the things that you want to take away, but you're right. Like the hard things, the difficult things that most quarterbacks struggle with, he looked fine doing his anticipation was there, um, which, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I think Deshaun struggled with early on. Yeah. One of the things me and you always talked about was his anticipation when it came to his wide receivers it was, it, it took like two or three years for him to really develop and understand that it's, you know, one, two, three throw in that system yeah. um, and leading them. And uh, he did that though. Yeah. So uh, on that Nico play, right. Like he, he literally led Nico exactly where he needed to be. Um, so uh, yeah, I agree. And and when you talk about the footwork and the basics, like those, like the footwork, his footwork looked ten times better than what it looked like in Stanford. Yeah, yeah ten I times think, better. Yeah. yeah, and he got the ball out so quick, and I think that that was probably so Sean's biggest fault, wasn't it? So you know, to, we're going to again, we're going from one extreme to the other, you know, like the coaches stuff. But yeah, I think he was timed at two point two, two point three seconds, quick release. Yep. And and yep. you know, sometimes that's not always necessary. I put a clip earlier and it didn't realize it was on coverage. Anthony Clare just sat down nicely in behind the linebacker because the linebacker just let him go in behind them expecting the secondary. And actually if he'd have gone him, he would have added you know another seven or eight yards onto the completion that he got. But yep. it was still a good rep, you know, and I think there's a lot to work with there. And I think He's had unnecessary pressure put on him. I think and that that's that's the the thing you'll have to he'll have to find a way to deal with. But as you said, you know, if he'd hit Anthony Miller in the back of the end zone, I think he would have had a far better game than he did because it would have just skyrocketed his confidence. So you know, sometimes it just takes one or two plays at the right time in games to build momentum as a player and well, quarterback. You're a golfer. I'm a golfer, right? It's you may have a bad day, right? But yeah. that one shot that you hit. That one shot where you walk away like, whew, and we all have one every round. And yeah. that's what gets you to come back is like you have that one yeah. shot, whether yeah. it be with your hybrid and your 280 to the 280 yards away and you land on the green, you're like, okay. And so you're hundred percent right. Like from a confidence perspective, I think another thing that, that I took away from the game and you know, it, it wasn't much, but I'll tell you this, Tyrod kind of surprised me a little bit. And I kind of wish this got a little bit more, uh, you know, I, I wish people were talking about it a little bit more, mm. but he definitely looked poised. The connection with Chris Conley is there. Yep. He was making throws that usually in, in, in the timid offenses that he's ran in the past, you don't normally see. Um, Tyrod actually looked really good. Yeah. What, what did you think of the scheme overall? I think obviously it's similar. It does look like there's been some teaks very similar. In it. Yeah. Um, there's maybe been some small teaks, but obviously you're not going to show your hands in these games. Um, but I think the the play action rollout, the one where he got to Chris Conley for the first completion or, or one of the, the, the sort of earlier completions was good. I think that suits him. Um, and the, the you know the, that kind of leading off that play action zone run. I know we kind of set up quite heavy power towards the end of the game. I, I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of cautious. The biggest problem last year not running the ball well was because we just flip-flopped from power to zone all the time. Um, and it, I mean, we were never proficient at one or, one of the either. But um, I think it's it's uh, it's definitely it definitely looks like, you know, that we could have done a lot worse. And I think everybody said that at the time. It was probably the best backup guy you could get. Um, and he's serviceable. And if you, if the scheme, you know, and, and Tim Kelly's probably matured as a play caller as well. Once he got the, the reins taken off him from from uh, Uncle Bill, he, he looked more confident and he, and he let it loose a bit, you know, and I think, and I don't think Tyrod is going to be able to, you know, break games open with, with accurate long balls all the time um, in the way that obviously Deshaun did, but I th there's definitely, definitely some reasons for optimism and hopefully this week in, in Dallas we'll get a bit better look at that. Yeah, I, I would expect, I would expect us to get, you know, a quarter out of Tyrod this, yeah. this week, which yeah. would be awesome. Uh, yeah. I would assume this will be kind of like the, the third preseason game yeah. in years past where you see a little bit more of the starters um but yeah it'll be interesting to see what you can do with Tyrod I mean <clears throat> he hasn't had one of those careers where you're like this guy is a hall of famer or anything like that but he had, ha has had a career where he makes some throws and and, and 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 makes some plays where you're like if you could do that consistently like there, there's definitely something there but he's never been able to put it together consistently um so we'll see but I mean with the tight ends that we have 
that's one thing that, you know, I've been telling John for since we signed Tyrod, it's going to be interesting to see with Aikens and Farrow, you know, what they're able to do because Tyrod loves the tight ends. He loves mm-hmm. the short underneath stuff. And it's, it's crazy that we're seeing the camp battle between Aikens and Farrow Brown because they really are two different wide, two different tight ends. And it, it, it's awesome to know that we kind of have that thunder and lightning at tight end. Farrow last year was, he exceeded everybody's expectations. Yeah, yeah, big time. Uh, and, you know, Jordan has – he's always looked great, but he's never really had the opportunity whether balls be thrown to him or whatever it may be. Uh, but we've also seen his yak ability. Yeah. You know, San Diego game. You know, we see it – we've seen it plenty of times. So, when you look at the two, it's really like the perfect combo. And then you add Tyrod to the mix, and it's like, okay, this, this is going to be a very interesting offense. <clears throat> Yeah, there's definitely pieces to work with. Obviously, we never saw much of Pharaoh Brown. And you know, I suppose it goes back to that Tunsil example where he says he's you know, got COVID and Pharaoh Brown's still talking about trying to get his win back after a couple of months. Um, so, you yep. know, it's, um, he's probably still kind of finding his, his rhythm. And obviously, you know, we've got training camp. I mean, the players are probably right out, still out there right now as we're talking just now. So you know, there's a lot to... There's a lot to probably be, you know, mildly optimistic, I think, about this, the way this has kind of come together. And I would say the coaching staff as a whole were... I think are ahead of schedule, I think, and where you would have thought they could have got, you know, 53, 54, how many players were up to now to be as coherent and be fundamental and be organised um, as they were. And I think that that's a big positive. Staying on the offensive side of the ball, James, in terms of the run game, that's the biggest improvement we've got to make this year. What did you, I know we saw Philip Lindsay early. I don't think they ran it particularly well against, uh, you know, maybe a couple of starters in there. Um and I, the biggest takeaway I took, and I know it was only one series, I think, but it, it's hard to, it's probably overly harsh to judge him, but he's not played football in two seasons. Um, but is Justin Britt going to be an upgrade over Nick Martin? Because he whiffed on that, on that, uh, on that third down conversion. Um, he went up to the second level, completely missed him. Um, and he didn't, and then there was a couple of run plays where he didn't really move bodies in the way I kind of had the perception of him when I watched him in, in Seattle. So, I think starting off with Justin Britt and the run game, what do you, where do you see it being? I know we've probably not got all the answers yet. I think um, I, I think it'll be an upgrade over over Nick Martin. Nick Martin has plenty of those plays in his uh, oh yeah in his film. Yeah. Um, and I think the biggest issue with Nick Martin that we've seen in the past was just a lack of consistency. He'd have games where he was he was a really good center. And you would think like, okay, like you should be able to put this together on a consistent matter, but he was never able to do it consistently. Um, So I'm hoping that the the biggest upgrade from Britt to Martin is just the fact that there will be some, some consistency in his game. And I think that's really what you want to look for is just consistency from the center position because you've never had it with Nick Martin. Um, And that just kind of goes back to the line in general. Any, any consistency is going to be key for this offensive line. But it does start with Justin Britt. And, um, you know, I, I, I haven't watched all 22 yet of, uh, of the game, so I, I'm not really too sure. I didn't watch a lot of offensive line um, play. I was really more focused on just the overall offense, and I, I really was enamored with trying to watch Davis Mills and his mm-hmm. progression um, and then the defense. But I do think that, you know, Justin has, has a career that shows he is better than Nick Martin. We just have to hope that we get that out of him because he is a bit older. Yeah, and yeah, and being two years out, you just don't know how somebody's body will react, yeah. and they don't know yeah. themselves. I think until they get the pads on and take their first couple of lumps over the first couple of weeks. But yeah, that was just, just you know, and it's just maybe a mild concern. It might be harsh, but on one drive, but you'd expect, you know, against backups, pure backups, and both levels of the defense, then you, you kind of got to hope your your veteran players you're probably to be a bit smarter. And I suppose that's probably the caveat with all these evaluation of Saturday night is the fact that you know there wasn't a single starter there, and Green Bay are talking about knowing roughly 40, 45 of guys that are going to make their 53, whereas we're probably the inverse. You know, we're probably, you know, 15, 16 guys who were held out. Um, and we're looking for answers at, you know, at probably 30 plus positions. So to, to, to bulk out the back end of the roster, what did you think of Philip Lindsay and the run and the way he ran the ball? And then obviously uh, the, the, the play we're talking about there in terms of David Johnson got one carry. Um, Cause I thought Scotty Phillips out of the three was, was the, uh, was the takeaway. I think um, 
Well, one that the David Johnson power play up the middle, like it was just so reminiscent of what we saw early on last season that it was just yeah. like, really like we didn't learn, <laughs> we didn't learn at all about that. Like, and I get it. Mark Ingram didn't have any snaps. Like I would think that that would probably be a Mark Ingram run um, in, in a normal game, but um, you know, David shines in outside counters, things of that nature. And mm-hmm we didn't utilize them for that with Phil Lindsay. Um, you know, I think it's going to be something to build on and we'll see more from, I mean, when you look at all the running backs, the one guy that we should put our money on getting a majority of the snaps based on what he's done over the last three years, four years is Philip Lindsay. Um, he's still young enough. He doesn't have that much mileage on him. Um, and there's no reason to think that he'll be better as the season goes on. Um, but I mean, it was just an average performance for me from from Lindsay, I agree with you. Scotty Phillips definitely looked more decisive. Um, he looked like he just had a better understanding of the run scheme, um, looked yeah. more comfortable, but he also has more to prove. Um, I, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, com- I know competition is, is the key word for all of camp, but uh, Lindsay's making the team, right? Yeah. David Johnson's making the team. Mark Ingram's making the team. So Scotty knows he has to outperform when he has a chance. Yeah. And uh, that, that's exactly what he did we'll have to wait and see in, in preseason game two and kind of what that run game looks like, but Scotty's making a name for himself and it'll be interesting if, you know, I guess we'll take four running backs. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, Quisenberry's got a chance to, to, to be a fullback on this team if they want to commit to the run um, and he looked like he can block. So yeah, you know, we've not, we've not had enough of those. Uh, I know we kind of flip flop in and out of love of having a, a tailback and then, you know, it's Jordan Aitkins and, Pedro Brown have both kind of filled in those H-back looks, you know, pre-snap. Um, but yeah, I think Scotty Phillips, the biggest thing for me was the, the, the he sort of ran a, 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 a slant inside for a third down conversion um, and he caught it falling down. The ball kind of came at a funny angle and he showed that he can make plays out the backfield and catch the ball. So, you know, in a year um, where you've got, you know, autonomy to probably get things wrong more than you would otherwise. And when you've got a guy who is younger in the legs and what we've missed at that position for the entirety of the O'Brien year was a player reduce um, at that level. And he looks like he's got a bit. It might just be a third back, third down back, catch the ball at the backfield, do a bit of running um, as a relief for Philip Lindsay. Um, and you might have David Johnson there when you've, you've got, you know, uh, dual backs in the, in the backfield. But I think he, I would like, I'd love to see him, James, play with some starters and play against some of Dallas's front guys and just see what he does. Um, and give them that chance because you're not really going to learn anything about David Jones. You're not going to learn anything about Mark Ingram, um, and you're, you know, and Philip Lindsay probably needs the reps just to kind of get his, get his legs going again. But I would love to see him just play that role um, in Jerry World this weekend and just see what he's got because I think there's there's a lot there um, to like. Um, I think yeah, and Chris Connell, as you said, was the, was probably the big one. Nico probably didn't get the ball enough. Um, he was actually on that on that play we talked about earlier when it was. Uh, in, in behind it, and he just overthrew Anthony Miller. And obviously, Anthony Miller then gets the gets the uh, gets the shoulder issue later on. Um, I don't think he registered a catch, but actually, Nico Collins was was streaking across the field on the dig on that one. So again, maybe a learning point for for uh, Mills to you know take the underneath on third down if you if you have to um, to stay on the field. But yeah, I think overall the offense was was good. I think for me, uh, Justin McCray and Cole Toner, yeah, not good enough um, in terms of some of their snaps and. Yeah, it's probably we could have anticipated that, but you know there is probably you know a space for one of those on the inside as we as we stand today. Um, and we've probably talked. Let me about ask it. you this: Yeah, with your thought, you know, with the tight end situation and Quisenberry coming in as the fullback. Yeah, you know, we know Brevin Jordan's going to make the team. Yeah, we're pretty sure Aikens and, and Farrow make the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if they carry four tight ends, I would assume Quisenberry will kind of play that yeah. fullback tight yeah. end role and that does that mean Kahali is out oh he's gone yeah I mean unless he does something unless he has the best game he's ever played in college and <laughs> um and in the pros because he's certainly not done anything on the field and I know the interception was for him um I'm pretty certain he got a penalty at one point um and look he, he looks the part but how long do you continue with somebody I think he's a good practice squad con- candidate and if somebody wants to take a chance in him and develop him then so be it but I think he's had enough time now to be able to come in and and run the offense efficiently. And it's never quite worked out for him. I think he's had one catch in Indianapolis, and that was about it. 
you know, so I think there's, there's not enough there. And you saw Brevin Jordan, okay, he anticipated the contact too much, dropped that pass from Mills uh, down in sort of the final third of the field in the second quarter, and he needs to be better than that, and he knows that. Uh, but I think when you listen to Brevin Jordan in front of the media, you think he's probably the kind of guy you want to put, place your bets on rather than uh, than than think of Ali wearing at this stage. But, yeah, he might be a practice squad candidate, or you could put him on IR um, again, you know, and bring him back because you can bring back guys in three weeks. Um, so, you know, he might be one of those stashes again, if, if a final chance. But, yeah, no, I think he's gone from that. Uh, I thought Gary and Christian was okay on the edge as well. I thought he did a not bad job at left tackle. Um, yep. And Fjordholt that came in threw some big blocks, you know, but he's a big guy. Yeah. So um, he threw some in there as well. So there's a, some interesting battles that can continue on there. On the defensive side of the ball, James, we'll move on. I was actually quite pleasantly surprised by the whole defensive line. I mean, I think Bobby King's obviously doing a great job there. But Vincent Taylor, actually, I thought looked pretty decent, considering some of the tape I've seen in Cleveland. I thought, yeah, I was, I was quite impressed with that. And I thought the defensive line, the whole, was a big plus. You uh, broke up there. You said, um, who was it that surprised you? It kind oh, of Vincent, Vincent Taylor, yeah. He got a oh, Vincent Taylor, yep. yeah, yeah, a throwaway. Um, and I think the defensive line as a whole, I think Bobby King's doing well. Um and I think that, that it looked like they were active with their hand fighting. Um, they ran like a, I don't know if it was by design, but they ran a stunt in the t- that sort of twist. Um, the one that that uh, Vincent Taylor got the throw away from Love. So yeah, I, I thought overall, considering there was no Malik Collins, who's probably their number one guy, they've kind of made that clear. Whitney Merciless, I'm assuming, is making the team because he didn't get it out there. Um, but the defensive line, a whole, I thought Ross Blacklock showed a nice shed and release and, and made a you know got to the ball carrier pretty quickly so it looked like you know again we'll go back to that fundamental point of coaching but I think the defensive line as a whole looks solid and you know I think less than 50 yards rushing for Green Bay so albeit again the seconds but yeah I think positive and a lot of competition there really is a lot of competition at both those two interior and both edge spots yeah I you know I've been I've been screaming about the defensive line I think for about four or five weeks the biggest thing that we're going to get from this defensive line that we haven't gotten in years past is it's not reliant on one guy. We're, we're not looking at one guy to be able to take over and do what is needed. It's going to be a team effort from the defensive line. Like Charles, I mean, he wasn't even out there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like you said, Malik Collins wasn't out there. So there, there's definitely rooms to even improve, but I agree. Like they looked very aggressive with their hands. Um, they all of them look to have a motor that didn't stop. Um, you know, Roy Lopez really is looking like the player that he, he people are deeming him to be in training camp. Um, you know, Johnson looked great. Everybody, it, it's all coaching. And you're right. Like when you go back to Bobby King, like that's what we're seeing from this defensive line is we're seeing a very well coached defensive line that wants to get after the ball and get after the quarterback. Um, And they looked really good. And, you know, there's not going to be a star that has, you know, there might not even be a guy on this team that has 10 sacks. No, there there probably won't be right. The only guy that potentially could is either Malik Collins or Charles Amini, who just has a breakout year. But outside of those two candidates, nobody else is going to have a 10 sack season. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to come from everywhere else. You know, Jacob Martin might get four or five. Charles Amini, might get four. Malik Collins might get five or six. You know, seven, eight, you know, Whitney might get two or three, you know, mm-hmm. Johnson might get two or three, Lloyd Lopez gets two or three, but, you know, Shaq Lawson gets five or six. Like that's where it's going to come from. And, and honestly, when you look at how you build a defensive line, if you don't have that anchor, that JJ Watt, you know, that, that, I don't want to say Leonard Williams or, you know, Quinn Williams or yeah. Miles Garrett, or if you don't have that guy, this is how you attack the quarterback. And I think it's, I'm very impressed with the defensive line. I, I I definitely think that the defense is going to turn some heads this year. Yeah, I thought they set the edge well. Um, they, they you know they, they moved, they, they didn't over pursue at times, and they did. They complemented one another exclusively. Rush four. There was various like, little DB kind of blitz. Jacob Martin set the edge. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, the, and I like, think, yeah, and he's he's put on some weight. I think he looks heavier. Yep. So, um, yep. I, I one guy you mentioned there, James Shaq Lawson. He was playing late on and. He's not looked great in the snaps he did have. I don't think he did a huge amount. And I suppose BMAC was a guy you were going to cut anyway. Um, but I don't yep. think he's performed at the level they thought he might um, so far. And that might just be COVID. It might be just getting his legs underneath him. Um, Could also know. be he doesn't buy in. Could also be he doesn't buy in and he wants to go to another team. I mean, this guy, we're talking about a guy who's had 
the same issues everywhere he's been. You know, he's always underperformed. This isn't a guy. It's not like we traded for a guy that averages 15 sacks a season. We're talking about a guy who flashes at times, but has never been consistent his entire career. Yeah, well, yeah, I think any any guy that hits the market that isn't up by the team that drafted them, it's, you know, it's a telltale sign. And a guy that went to a team on a deal, and they felt like he didn't perform in that deal, and that's why they swapped them plus a pick. So, um, yep. it, you know, the deal read on paper that Miami were getting the bigger asset than we were. So, um, so yeah, uh, we'll we'll see we'll see where where, where that goes. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, lot, lot to like. I think one, there was a set of plays. Um, I'm probably not the only person to talk about that. There was three plays back to back right at the end of the first quarter. The first, the, th- the final third of those plays was in the third in the second quarter. Uh, and Vernon Hargreaves get beat on a slant inside against Amari Rogers. He gets beat against Devin Funches on a sort of dig kind of route. Comes in, uh, cuts inside in front of him, and then he takes a terrible pursuit angle uh, on that screen pass, uh, along with a couple other players. Uh, Gruger Hill and uh, Eric Murray, who I thought both actually were okay. And I think uh, Gruger Hill might be the fastest linebacker we've had, but um, for a long time. But but yeah, I think Vernon Hargreaves, how how these rated um, why this coaching staff, a uh, subsequent coaching staff, um, I know there's some holdovers, but he showed again that you know he cannot play on the outside. He's just not got the he's just not got the transition, the athleticism, and they just went at him three times, and that was it. Um, so you've got to hope. Uh, yeah, you would never hope somebody's not on the roster, but he's certainly shown all last season extensively, and and again um, on Saturday night that he's not up for that he's he's not up to the task. And I suppose that's probably the concern. Does the additions of Des King and Terence Mitchell pull us out a position that we're in last year? Because that was probably the biggest glaring issue in this team. And I don't know if those two guys alone, plus Roby for sixteen out of the seventeen games, is enough. Yeah, I think um, you know. With, with Hargraves, you know, all the camp highlights you see, he, he, from what I've heard, he's playing fourth or fifth corner, right? Yeah. So, yeah, maybe he'll go in and make a flashy interception or things of that nature, but that's when he's not playing massive amounts of snaps. Yeah. I think Vernon as your fifth, fourth corner, I think it's fine. But I think if you're asking Vernon to go out there and <laughs> sit on the outside for an entire game, you're just asking for trouble. Oh, we know you just I'm. can't. <laughs> yeah, you just can't. You can't expect him to do that. Um, you know, trading Keon Crossan, um, who last year showed some ability to play, uh, and keeping Vernon Hargraves on the roster. You know, I think this might be one of those situations where it's it's probably the first time that we can somewhat kind of debate whether Nick Casario made the right decision or not because. He may feel like there's depth at cornerback, but if, if the plan is Vernon Hargraves is your fourth or fifth, I would have much rather had Keon Crossan as your fourth or fifth and not had that 2023 six-round pick. Yeah, I suppose you, you get a guy for a six, you flip him two years later for a six. He's undersized to play on defense. And they, I think it would seem anyway that Tremont Smith will take that role. And I think they probably thought we've got two players playing the same role and we don't need both. Um, and it was a chance to get some value, albeit a 23rd six. Uh, but, you know, if a former coach wants you back, who was in a building that they drafted you, and wants you back on his team, who was a special teams coach. But, you know, it does say, you know, it, he will be a loss. And I think he'll always be a plus for a team on special teams, Keon Cross. Um, you know, high motor guy, um, big energy, um, you know, the type of guy that people want in their building. So, yeah, uh, it, yeah, it would, I think it would have been better if it was a six this year. That probably would have, you know, sweetened the deal I a agree. little. Um, because a six in a year's time is, yeah, so, so, so. Uh, but yeah, interesting move. And I, I, I think it's probably a position that they'll look to add at the waiver wire or something like that, you know, if they can get somebody, a developmental corner, because it feels like they're a little bit light there. Um, particularly going, considering how early Hargreaves was out there, um, you know, after the, the, the starters and inverted commas were, came out um, off the field there. But, um, yeah, an interesting one. John Reed wasn't a guy we saw a lot of. I think could he join Isaiah Cooler as the another casualty of last year's draft class pretty quickly? Uh, I can't see it. No, I I, I can't see it that early. Yeah. Maybe 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 final you know cut down days, but I can't see it that early. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, he's got. 
I mean, if anything, you know, in, in camp, or if you remember what everybody was talking about last year in camp, I mean, who were they talking about in camp last yeah. year? In the yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, it's going to take some time. Um, you just have to wonder, like, where's his spot going to be? Because yeah. if Desmond King is going to play safety or play play your nickel, then where's Reed going to play? Because he's another undersized corner. Um, so there's got to be a spot for him. But uh, you have to wonder if there's not somebody else outperforming. And, I mean, I don't know if the secondary – the secondary to me, the biggest issues I've had with the secondary in the past isn't necessarily always the secondary. It's always been the lack of – pressure applied by the defensive line like you Mm -hmm. can have five Deion sanders on your team but if there's no pressure on the defensive Mm -hmm. line and the quarterback has seven seconds to throw it's really not going to matter because somebody's going to get open yeah it's just too much time to cover so if they can start to mix in and show some of the pressure from the defensive line whether it be a scheme thing blitzes or just overall better performance from the defensive line i think the secondary could be a lot better than what it's been um you know, Roby, Roby Mitchell King, I would say is probably, I mean, is that the best secondary we've had since Jonathan Joseph and A.J. Bouye? Well, yeah, I think Jonathan Joseph and A.J. Bouye probably set out there as that one, was it 2017 season? It's probably only 16, 15, yeah. Yeah, or is it 15? Yeah, 16, probably. Yeah, because, yeah, the year before Watson was 16, yeah. Um, it's probably the only one that's been serviceable. Um, and I, I mean, I, Obviously, the yeah, it's, it's a well well trodden story about letting boy go and uh, punting on Kevin Johnson. It didn't quite work out, but yeah, right. no, it probably it probably is better. I think, and it probably if, if you can keep those three guys healthy after Roby serves his one game suspension, then yeah, it's probably um, Lonnie got a lot of snaps, but I think you know I think that's just because he needs them. He's not played enough at that position in his entire life, so um, he got there. I think Eric Murray's going to be a bit liability, but Justin Reed's is is hopefully going to finally realise his potential. Um, and that may, that may or may not be here after this year, um, depending on the contract, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll see on that one. But yeah, I think it's, it's interesting on the defensive, on the, on, on the defensive back end, I think it's because they certainly showed that they're not sentimental about cutting people because Isaiah, Isaiah Cooler, did he get that many snaps? I know he almost came down with that one on Saturday, but, um, but he was out of bounds and he's gone, you know, so uh I don't think they'll be they'll be too precious, and I think there'll be plenty more moves to make. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a couple more trades as well, particularly up front, because I think we've got decent depth guys there that could get other sixes and sevenths um, potentially. And we've seen that we've seen that in the past. And Casario's not shy of a move anyway. I think that's that's for no, sure. he's not. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that it's going to be interesting to see how they you know they pair Lonnie and and, and Justin because you know is Lonnie going to play more of that Cam Chancellor role um, that that guy in the, in, in the, on the back end, that is the hard hitter, yeah, physical, so. yeah. strong safety. I mean, that's what it looks like, right? Yeah. It yeah. looks like it'll, he'll play more of that type of strong safety. Um, and then Justin Reed will kind of be everywhere floating in the back and, and things yeah. of that nature and covering. So um, it's and, interesting. I, yeah. And I think Desmond King's probably an underrated important piece in this because, you know, you saw that one play where uh, Lonnie flew at the ball and you can only really do that if you've got a safe, uh, if you've got a slot corner who can follow guys across in between the numbers. And if you don't exactly, that, then you've got, you've got to hold off and wait for the, the second phase of the play to go and make the tackle. Um, so he, you know, he could really change that. And I think, I suppose we probably saw that in 2018, didn't we, with Tyron Matthew and Kareem Jackson. Exactly. It just made everybody look so much, but we didn't have great corners. Uh, well, we had Jonathan Joseph's later end and, and nobody else. And, uh, and we got away with it for a lot of the year, you know, because the safety play covered it up. So, um, and then we had Justin Reed coming in as a third. So, you know, that was probably the best ever safety um, spot we've had in, 20, in 2018. Um, and it covers up a lot. And it's all symbiotic, as you said. I think the probably the big question is, are we going to be able to get enough pass rush? And that's that's the question that it'll have to be a mix of creativity and uh, and rotation. I think that'll, that'll get us there. Um, but, that you know, and that may fall at times and that may cost us games. But I think there's... You know, there's a reason why it's probably the number two position that teams go after after quarterback. So until you get premier talent in there, it's uh, you can't always rely on rotation and what have you. But um, Dallas this weekend, James, is there anything particularly you want to look for? And I suppose you've got the added angle of hard knocks as well covering the team. So, um, you know, you'll get you'll get a bit more insight um, to maybe some things that like uh, like we saw in the past. But yeah, quite an exciting uh, time to be going up there as the sort of main preseason game up to Dallas. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it'll be, 
you know, watching the offensive line, who's back, who's able to play, you know, where's Titus play, um, you know, is Tunsil, you know, he tunsils out, so he's not going to be playing. Yeah. So um, it'll be interesting to see that. I really want to start focusing on guard play, see how the guards are playing. Is Max Sharping returning back to 2019 or is he still, you know, 2020 Max Sharping? Um, Because that's a guy that I've always, I felt really good about his rookie year Hmm. and then fell off last year can he come back because he really showed a ton his rookie year yeah, um, so right, is guard, the coaching... uh, right. Mm-hmm. so it's going to be interesting to see so um, it's always the adage isn't it you know, the defense, offensive line is just trying to wipe, wipe, wipe your ass for your other hand it's not easy so uh, no. moving aside so we'll see I, I think that's a lot of I pressure tra- putting a third year guy yeah I agree I, I tried to do what you just said uh, earlier this morning and I fell <laughs> <laughs> um, but no I think uh so, so I'll be watching the offensive line. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see the defensive line with Charles and back as well. Um, hopefully we'll see some more snaps for Jacob Martin. Um, kind of one of those guys that really should be getting more snaps and we're hoping that he's going to get it. He's a fan yeah. favorite. Um, but is he, is he a coaching favorite, right? Is, do the coaches mm-hmm. see what the fans think we see? Um, uh, you know, Justin Reed, will he play this week? So him and Lonnie, will we get a taste of that? And then Davis Mills, um, you know, I, I'm really – Here's everybody keeps wondering, like, why are you pushing Davis Mills so hard? Why are you so excited about That's the time to do it? Isn't it? Yeah. There's that, and then it's a big fuck you to Deshaun Watson as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If, if, if if you can hit on Davis and you can have that transition from Deshaun to Davis and not have much of a drop off and have a franchise quarterback, yeah, it makes all of this so much easier. Right. And we know Tyrod isn't that guy. Right. So the only guy we have that we can hope for being potentially that guy is Davis Mills. And it's not very often that you are able to make that, uh, you know, that transition. I mean, not many teams do when you lose a franchise quarterback. It's very rare that you're going to be able to also get a franchise quarterback that same year. And I don't know. I don't think Davis Mills is for sure. But I, I, I like what we've seen enough to be able to think that maybe there's a chance yeah and that's that's it i like the, i like having a chance yeah, yeah. i'm a very optimistic person right yeah. so uh, you know if there's a chance that means that you know maybe something happens and i'd rather have a chance than no chance yeah and i would give every single one of the reps after tyler goes out to davis mills and do not put jeff Driscoll on the field because no one is winning and no one is winning and if and look if he's if he's mailing ones over you know the head of the wide receiver four, five, six, because they don't got the timing right. I'd rather he did that and learned from it, and he got he got tape, and he can get as many teaching points as possible. Uh, because there was a great example in the end zone, and the red zone play is obviously his big weak spot. So I think there was a play where there was a, a rub route on one side. Anthony Miller actually walks into the right corner of the end zone, completely un, uh, unguarded. It's an easy easy score. Zip it out to the near side to get him. He locks on Brevin Jordan. The DB rushes, so I can see he comes from that side, so I can see why he's going to that side. Um, but he didn't he didn't place the throw right because he had something in his face. So, you know, he needs to learn. He needs to go through this stuff because it's not the same as playing the Pac-12. Um, so we'll, we'll find out. Uh, but I think, yeah, give all the, give all the reps to him. Um, let's see Scotty Phillips. And let's see, you know, what does it look like when somebody goes against Zach Martin? What does it look like when somebody's covering C.D. Lamb? Even if it's for eight or nine reps, Let's just see what it looks like and we'll get a better idea of where we are because we probably don't have the equivalent of those guys on our team. Um, so, you know, let's see what it looks like and uh, and see before we head out, James, it, have you, has your outlook changed on this team at all or is it are you still work in progress as we get ready for, for week one? And what do you think we need to see to get ready for week one? You know, I think my, my thoughts on the team have changed in the sense of like, you know, not a popular opinion, but I, I kind of think that we were all fooled to think about the way that this team was managed and handled, you know, with Easterby and this search for power and, you know, the way that we were handling Deshaun Watson and where he's going and how it's going to happen and all of that. I think when you put all of that into a pot, I definitely think it's, it's very hard for anybody, whether it be media or fan to really have a decisive, um, uh, approach and understanding of what this team is capable of doing right um and you know with that being said i I do i like what they're doing you know i think they knew that they weren't going to have their franchise quarterback and so what they do they signed a bunch of one-year guys 
um, that they hope to potentially hit on to be able to be other part, you know, long-term fixes at a position. They signed the best quality backup quarterback that you could sign. They went out and got all the best coaches pretty much um, that they could. Um, And they brought in a head coach who may not be the most decorated, but the players respect and want to play for. And then the general manager, you know, I honestly, I don't know if we could have hired a better general manager at this point. Uh, I know everybody criticized it and it's Patriots South and every other reason that you would want to not to like the hire. And it all makes sense. But man, when you look at how he's managing and dealing with the situations that we have, I I don't know what else could have been like, I don't know what else Nick could do that he hasn't done to be honest. And I guess that's what I'm looking at. So I'm excited. I bought season tickets. I, oh, I, yeah. You know, was that, it, was, that's it, was how... it the Texans pop that swayed you? Was, it, was that what it was? Or the, or the, the football the Texans feeling? what? You know, they got a dog that they're going out. They've created a Twitter account for the dog and everything, and they've tried to soften up their marketing. And, oh, uh, the pop. Yeah, yeah. For me, it was, uh, it was more about the fact that um, the dip, technically, right? Like, if you look at stuff, you watch yeah, stocks yeah, or you yeah, buy so stocks. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. You know, we last 17 16 years you couldn't get season tickets you were on a list i mean last year i was on a list and i had thirty six thousand people ahead of me yeah um all of a sudden that changed yeah. and so this team isn't going to be terrible forever eventually it'll pop it'll change we're not the browns you know we have we yeah. have success we have more playoff wins than a lot of teams yeah and people just kind of tend to forget that right so um that's why i bought it and then it just gives me an opportunity to do something with my son so yeah um and he doesn't care about Easterby and he doesn't care about, you know, he's nine. He can care less about what the organization is yeah. doing and not doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's all cyclical. I think you, and you're probably right. I mean, I was, I was one of the people that removed myself uh, from it. Um, I don't know if we'll get to a game this year. It's still in limbo. Uh, if they'll, uh, yeah. if they'll change their mind on that, uh, you guys can come this way. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's not opened up yet, but I'm, um, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll get to a game, James. We'll we'll get to finally uh, finally do that do that what we've said for a few years now. But um, well, if yeah. you if you do get to, I got your ticket. So just right. you pick a game if you're able to yeah. travel out here. Yeah, uh, from a, a, take a trip over the pond. That's it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think there's been you know we've just been waiting to, to see if the announcement comes. It's probably not going to come. I don't know. Yeah. You think less likely as you get in the winter, but. Uh, but yeah, hopefully, yeah, we said we'd do a live at the tailgate pod or something like that. So, um, not forgotten about that. It's just, uh, it's just uh, logically impossible at the minute, physically impossible. So, we'll see. But uh, no, I think it's, yep. it, it felt like it turned the page a little, didn't it? I think at the weekend, and that's the big thing I took out of it is we feel like we're edging closer to, as you said, it's in the dip, um, but we're edging closer to to something new. So, um, it won't change until the Sean stuff clears itself up. However, that ends up, but. It felt like, as you said, and I think Caserio is a three-year eval because the real test will come when he has the the top end picks and who he brings in and the next head coach and all those big decisions. Uh, when when the good times have got a chance to come back in again, but I felt like Saturday for the first time felt about football, and it's uh, I feel like just creeping towards a bit like coming out of COVID, isn't it? It's just like creeping to normality, isn't or the normalcy that everybody's harped on about. But uh, yeah, it was a good step forward, mate. But thank you very much for your time. Um, Absolutely. Well, appreciated. Um, and I'm sure we'll speak plenty of times over the next couple of weeks, but uh, it feels like football's coming back. So, um, James, thanks very much for your time. Um, and thanks very much for listening. Click subscribe at the bottom corner. Um, hit like, give us some comments, give us a review on iTunes, all that good stuff. Trying to beef it up a bit this year. Um, great with the support. People like James, people like everybody reached out over the off season. Um, there'll be strength in numbers this season, but it feels like it's almost here for the Texans football. So thanks again for listening and we'll catch you again next week.